Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Unpredictable. On this episode, I'm hosting Kai Cheng Thom, an excellent writer, performance artist, and community healer. We have a lot to talk about, but we are going to focus on Kai's latest book, Falling Back in Love with Being Human. Hello, Kai. Thank you for being with us. Uh, thanks so much for having me. I'm so excited. Dear listeners, we are having a heavy rainy day in Toronto today. And you know, the best thing to do is to spend some time with your favorite books on your couch on these type of days. So in this mood, I believe Kai and I will have a very nice conversation. And I would like to start this conversation with some good news about your book, because it is featured as the book of the day by New York Public Library. You know, I had no idea, but um, uh, but yes, apparently it is the New York Public Library's book of the day, or maybe yeah. it was the book of the day yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Kai, your latest, Falling Back in Love with Being Human, is a collection of love letters. I, I don't know how many people write love letters these days, but this book shows the power of love letters. And this is what I thought as soon as I started to turn the pages of this book. Because these letters are not like basic romantic scripts. Once you dive into this book, this is my thought, you are faced with some strong, realistic, and touchy words that might make you question yourself. So my question is that these love letters are they telling us that try to get to know the people who hate you including you yourself and believe that you may be loved by them and by yourself i mean is this the way to reach some peace in your life mm, great question yeah well i believe that yes um so the 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 concept of falling back in love with being human is that all of the love letters are to um, people who don't love me or whom I struggle to love. And many of the letters are to parts of myself. Uh, so, you yeah. know, and I, that was unexpected. I really thought it was all going to be love. Like I was going to write these love letters to politicians and like conservatives, <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> people that I struggle with. And so much of the book ended up being um, like to myself that I was like, wow, okay. I'm like learning a lot. I should go to therapy. Um, I do. I go to therapy all the time. Um, you know, is is embracing and trying to understand people that we don't that yeah that hate us um, a way to find peace? I think so. I think it's not as simple or as easy mm -hmm. as some of like the new age or like kind of like um, popular self help wants us to think. Like, yeah. um, I think sometimes people struggle with this concept because they're like. Um, so I'm going to like forgive somebody who's hateful and then what? Are they going to stop hating me? No, they're not, right? <laughs> like if we think about people who are homophobic or people who are transphobic, it would be great if we could, you know, offer them love and they would love us back. The truth is that, you know, probably they're not going to. And so people then have the natural question, what's the point? What is the point of that? And I think it's a fair question. I think really, you know, what it is, is like the um, that uh, when people are hateful to us, or when we're, we're hateful to ourselves, we are dehumanized, right? Like um, yes. people who are transphobic or homophobic or racist, they dehumanize us or attempt to. And um, the act of loving oneself and others um, is a reclamation of one's humanity. Essentially, for me, it is saying to, um, like, people who are bigoted or people who are prejudiced that like I will not be diminished like I will not be made less human um, because of what they have done their hatred cannot make me less loving and that's the power I think in in doing this project it's you know what I hope people can get from reading the book or doing you know similar things but um for sure, it's. I think it can be controversial, and we have to arrive at this practice at the right time for ourselves. Perfect explanation. Thank you, Kai. I would like to ask a question about the prompts. Yes. Uh, because right after every letter, you have some instructions for your yes. readers. Something like prescriptions for healing. And the first letter comes with this instruction. Define the word 
monster without looking at a dictionary. If I remember correct, it, it was like this. Yeah. So depending on the letter, is that the way to eliminate the monster or to protect yourself from its harms? I mean, defining it, defining that monster, knowing what it is, how powerful it is, I mean, realizing that. Is this the way, uh, realizing that in the first place? I think it can be. I, I'm so glad you asked about this particular prompt. It's, I think, my favorite prompt in the whole book. You know, mm-hmm. can you define a monster without cheating? <laughs> right? <laughs> um, and here's the thing about that. I believe that there is no such thing as a monster. Um, and I also believe that there are many monsters out there. But a monster, you know, inside of us, what we believe is monstrous is really something that we would fear to become. And when we call other people monsters or we call them monstrous, what we are really saying is, that's not me. I don't want to be that. And the truth is we all have the capacity to behave in monstrous ways. And when we dissociate or when we reject that part of ourselves, and projected onto other people, this is the beginning of a dehumanization process. Um, And it is what opens the door to to violence. We are seeing that so much right now in the geopolitical sphere, for example, in Gaza, where um, the Israeli military nation state has been Mm -hmm. releasing this propaganda that is calling Palestinians monsters. And then the really terrifying thing you see is that when we call them monsters, then it is the Israeli military um, complex that behaves in the monstrous way. Mm -hmm. And so so this is, you know, my my invitation to people is to get to know the monster inside of ourselves, because when we do that, uh, mm-hmm. we become less likely to actually act monstrously. And this is, you know, this is like a deep, <laughs> like terrifying <laughs> meditation. We could go on for a long time, mm-hmm. but I think it's so important. Important because when we can love a monster, when we can love our own internal monster, this is when uh, we have the potential to bring more peace to the world. Based on your answer, I, I want to ask this question. Do you think does everyone has the potential of being a monster, even if they are victims? Oh, yeah. Controversial question. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I, I, this takes a lot of sensitivity to speak about well, but I'm going to try. I'm not Mm -hmm. that sensitive, but we'll try. (laughs) So, you know, can victims become monsters or monstrous? Yes. However, it is not that every victim becomes a monster, and it's not that um, if we are victimized by violence, that it's our fault. I think that's so important. No one deserves to experience, you know, um, violence, dehumanization. If we're thinking about geopolitics, you know, no one deserves to experience war crimes, torture, sexual violence. Nobody deserves to experience that, regardless, actually, of what they have done. Regardless. I, this is just, you know, for me, this is like a hard kind of principle, nobody deserves to experience that. Um, And um, I think what can happen inside of us is when we have experienced a harm, we naturally become fearful of experiencing it again. What kind of world is it out there that could commit that harm to me? We ask ourselves, oh, it's a bad world. And then very naturally, we want to defend ourselves. And this is where it gets a bit tricky. It's where we we say to ourselves, I have experienced a harm and therefore I am justified in protecting myself that things can get scary because of course we are justified in self-defense. Of course we are. But if we, in our self-defense, start to to dehumanize the other, then we can go down some very bad roads. And we are seeing, we we see that all the time. You know, I think there's a letter in my book to J.K. Rowling, who is the author of the Harry Potter series. And and she, you know, in the early days of expressing a lot of transphobia, she would refer to her own experience of domestic violence, which notably was not committed by a trans woman. It was committed by a man, her husband, but at the time, but maybe it was her boyfriend, I can't remember. But anyway, she... She experienced domestic violence. And then she, you know, the language she uses is to protect women and children, then we need to reduce the rights of trans people, you know, insofar mm-hmm. as self-identification, going into bathrooms, that sort of thing. And that's the logic. This is this is the mistake. You know, we are always allowed to defend ourselves. We are always, you know, we never deserve to experience violence. But it's when we say in our own self-defense, it is justifiable to remove the human rights of other people. That is when 
we become monstrous. Um, yeah. Truly, when our behavior becomes truly monstrous, you can people have all kinds of defenses to this, right? But this is what I believe. And if we really look at, you know, like the through, when we look at the patterns of history, this is what we see always, always: fascism, genocide, torture, um, prejudice, always excused by the feeling of, well, I'm in danger from that other person, and therefore um, my violence toward them is justifiable, and their violence toward me is not. This is where um, we see we see the beginning of um, like moral dissent. These are the words seriously need to be highlighted. I Thank think you a guys. lot, you know. I'm just like <laughs> sitting there on my sofa, like, how does genocide begin? You know, I'm just like <laughs> thinking about that all the time. You know, I'm not fun at dinner parties, truly. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, uh, the letter to the ones who hurt me. Yeah. That letter is already one of my favorites in this book. I see some determination in it. My question is, is it that easy to forgive someone who hurt you? Because uh, this is not like being cursed with some stupid words during a road rage. Because this stuff is a bit heavy. I mean, th th that stuff hurts you. Do you think it's that easy to forgive someone who hurt you or does it take some process? Forgiveness is a winding road. <laughs> <laughs> um, is it easy to forgive others who have hurt us? I mean, I think on the surface, the answer, of course, is no. You know, I, I have experienced some bad things, as probably a lot of us have. And then, so I have some experience personally around forgiveness. I also was a, um, was a counselor to teenagers for a long time, and I worked in the public sector. So a lot of the teenagers that I worked with had experienced like really, really awful things often committed by their family, right? Like by mm -hmm. their parents or their grandparents or the uncles, you know, all kinds of abuse. Um, and it was from these young people really that I learned a lot about forgiveness because actually often they would forgive <laughs> like, um, oh. oh, all the time. But the people that they would not forgive um, was themselves. It is hard to forgive someone who has hurt us, but I believe it is even harder to forgive ourselves for being someone, and this is where it doesn't make sense, mm -hmm. but we are angry usually at ourselves for being someone who allowed themselves to be harmed. That's how we kind of think, even though it doesn't make any sense, I think we usually have shame about being harmed. How could I have let myself be harmed? that way? Or how could I have been a person who invited or in some way deserved that harm? And if you speak with people, or if we think about, you know, the ways that we have been hurt ourselves and really investigate, we can often find a thread of that, like that shame that says, oh, I, I somehow did it. I somehow des deserved it. I somehow let it happen to me. And because we feel that shame and it's so unbearable, we tend to turn it outward. And this is what it, you know, it, it sounds like we're angry at the other person. How dare that other person hurt me? Or I'll get revenge on that person or demand justice, all that kind of thing. But often inside of us, we are defending ourselves from that fear of like, did I deserve it? Was I a person who somehow brought that harm upon myself? And this is not to say that we don't deserve justice. I, I Often I think we, we, we really need to tell the truth and talk about justice and you'll get redress. But truly, I think when we think about forgiveness and when, when people come to me and ask about forgiveness, the deepest question is, have you forgiven yourself? Um, which is not to say you are to blame. It just means often we are angry at ourselves. <laughs> and, and what we need to integrate is that we are not to blame. And it becomes much easier to forgive other people for having harmed us when we forgive ourselves for having experienced harm. I'm going to ask a specific question related to a letter again. You're telling us some of your awful experiences. I mean, being attacked, being bullied, and they are so sad. And you are saying that you were the only ones I couldn't forgive. This question is related to the previous one. Mm -hmm. In the letter to the ones who watched, you are saying that you were the only ones I couldn't forgive. Mm -hmm. So what makes those bystanders mm. worse than the attackers i mean do you think their attitude encourages the haters and attackers 
is it because of that or is oh, there you are asking such reasons? deep questions <laughs> so, so, you should be a journalist <laughs> i used to be a journalist <laughs> i know i know i looked up your bio <laughs> is that very this is like an armor piercing question right uh what makes them unforgivable um well you know it's true uh, so uh I, I have done a lot of work on forgiveness in my life mm -hmm. and, and truly still the thing that still often feels stuck for me is um, forgiveness of the bystander, you know, of any kind. And why is that so hard for me? Um, I think because for me, being a survivor of harm, um, just the pathway that I have taken and a lot of survivors I know too are very linked to the perpetrator. Mm -hmm. Um because of the intimacy of a violent action, because of how often we spend thinking about how could that person do that to me, we become very empathized in some ways. We can to to perpetrators of violence. And for sure, the types of violence that I experienced, like intimate partner harm or um, bullying from other children, I actually have a very deep empathetic window onto those people. Like, um, I can really see how maybe having, homo uh, like, be having queer feelings or you know being gender confused can make us then homophobic <laughs> toward <laughs> others right it's always the like secretly gay guys who are always the most homophobic you know um yes. uh, <laughs> right. uh, <laughs> and it's like you know i about when i think about jk rowling you know people who have ex women who have experienced harm are afraid of trans people i get that actually i can really see it but it's um because hatred is motivated by fear, and I understand fear. But bystandership I find very difficult. I don't understand why we live in a society where we observe human violence all the time, all the time, all the time. We see um, people who are homeless, people who are deprived. We see racism. We see exploitation. All the time we witness violence, and the the dominant culture paradigm is to say nothing and to do nothing. And I don't empathize with that. I, I really struggle with it, <laughs> probably because it's something I haven't resolved for myself yet, you know, but I, I really don't understand that. And when I think about the responsibility, I, the part that gets me so angry still is what I perceive as hypocrisy on the part of a bystander. So if we think about the Me Too movement, for example, this is a big movement where every, you know, lots of people are standing up and, um, speaking about having experienced sexual harm, which is great. Um, there were some, you know, unpleasant side effects, but overall, it's a good thing. But what I found so disgusting and hypocritical about bystanders in that moment is that somebody would say, denounce, I don't know, Woody Allen or Roman Polanski, right? These big time guys. And suddenly, hundreds of thousands or millions of people would say, yeah, disgusting, Roman Polanski. We hate Roman Polanski. We hate Woody Allen. But these are the same people who completely had read the news, you know, in the <laughs> 90s or, you know, whatever, or in the 70s, depending for Woody or for Roman, but like, you know, they they knew the story. Not not no new information came out at that time. They just were resigned. They just, you know, were actually supporting th those people. Or the same with um R. Kelly and what he did to Aliyah. You know, all these famous people had famously committed um horrific acts of sexual violence. Well, I don't know about Woody Allen, but Roman Polanski and R. Kelly for sure um had done these horrific acts, and it was very clear to the public and you know what had been done, and um no one said anything, and, and the opposite actually continued to support support their work. And then suddenly in the Me Too movement, everyone's saying, oh, how disgusting. And I just find that so hypocritical. Like, you know, I, Meryl Streep or, you know, all these um, kind of um, Hollywood women who took a stand against Roman Polanski in 20, between 2017 and 2020, those were the same people who were attending his award shows and acting in his movies multiple <laughs> years. And I just find that so, you know, it, it really enrages me because what we saw during Me Too or what we see in like moments of social upheaval is that the bystanders actually have the power. They have the power to end oppression and they have the power to stop the violence from happening. But they don't choose to do that. They choose instead to follow what is popular and what is trendy. And I just can't forgive that. I'm not done yet. I mean, I'm, I'm going to work on it. It's my next book, but I <laughs> am not over it. I can't get over that. <laughs> yeah. I believe the word hypocrisy you already mentioned, the word that needs to be underlined, I guess, in this issue, I guess. <laughs> You're sending letters to many people in your book and mm -hmm. and yourself, of course, with some naive and nice and sometimes 
with some sad words yeah. even to jesus yes, <laughs> jesus <laughs> so is there anyone uh, you think you missed or you didn't want to send a letter in uh-huh. this book in this project i mean someone who makes you feel that it's not worth to write a letter to that person or any spiritual thing i don't know did i miss a letter i mean maybe There were a few letters I wrote that didn't make the cut. <laughs> like didn't make it into the final book, you know. Mm-hmm. Like letters to my family and stuff. Mm-hmm. Things I didn't want, you know, as public. I used to write about my family Mm-hmm. all the time but now I'm getting a bit more like more cautious <laughs> about that but yeah you know the book was written in 2021 and it came mm-hmm. out in 2023 so there was kind of a gap I mean if I were to start rewriting it again today mm-hmm. there are probably I think a lot about people who are um, supposedly like the opposite or like diametrically mm-hmm. opposed to us like um, I think about like for example like um, people who voted for Donald Trump in the mm-hmm. American election 2016 people who are going to vote for him again in the upcoming election <laughs> I, if I were to write it again i i would really be curious about like writing letters um mm-hmm. kind of across the political aisle like that um to go like even deeper than this book went i think the reason i didn't go there the first time is because that was actually the original intention was to write more to like the trump supporter or like you know to um like evangelical christians like mm-hmm. that sort of thing i grew up in evangelical christian but i think in order to write someone a love letter you actually have to be like in real relationship with them mm-hmm. So, you know, I was trying to think about, could I write a love letter to like a working class white guy in the United States who's voting for Trump? And I don't think I could because I don't actually have that much relationships with working class white guys in the United States. And in order to write that letter and to write an, a, like a book with letters like that, I think would require me to like actually travel, like actually like have deeper conversations. And that's not something I was in the position to do in 2021, but it might be something I'm in the position to do now. Like I am very curious about talking to people who have very different perspectives from me I also I just want to have that with conversations in a way that like is humanizing and not like just like a debate you know I want to ask one question but it might be a bit personal aside these letters these low letters because they have some messages are you the one of those people who used to write low letters when you fell in love oh yeah regardless of sending them to the address <laughs> <laughs> are you You kidding i totally sent the love letter to the address <laughs> absolutely <laughs> no i'm a giant love letter fan i so when mm-hmm. i was a kid my favorite books and they're still my favorite books are like those in the epistolary form right like so um in letter format when i, I taught a um, year-long prose uh, like non-fiction prose writing class mm-hmm. this year and my students oh my god my poor students because i'd always say what a great essay you've written what if you rewrote it as a letter and they'd be like oh my god this is your only advice that you ever give i have to rewrite this as a letter <laughs> but here's the, the power of writing a letter i'm just going to get into it i'm just going to go in is that it is one of the very few forms that we write creatively in the second person we write to you uh, right dear you um and uh you know there's an intensity and an immediacy and intimacy to to using the second person writing from me to you that like is not possible uh, usually when writing in the third person when you write in the first person i mean you write in the first person in the letter as well mm-hmm. obviously um but when you only write in the first person it becomes a little bit narcissistic right you're always kind of looking inward <laughs> writing to the other person is looking outward and i just love that I, i it's so beautiful um you know the color purple by alice walker one of my favorite novels written mm-hmm. uh, you know largely in letters um i love letters i love letters and i love love letters and yes when i was a teenager all i wanted to do was to be the kind of poet who would write you know love letters and have fantastic love affairs frida kahlo another person who wrote a lot of love letters uh you know i wanted to be uh, romantic like that and um so yes i did write a lot of love letters um because of the age that i wrote them in a lot of them are emails but mm-hmm. this is the thing about emails is that you can always go back into your inbox and yes. find them and i have done that recently yes. 
I did. Yes, I did. Um, and they're so embarrassing. Like, you know, the love letters are so embarrassing because they're a reflection of your like most cringe, you know, parts, yes. especially what, oh God. I mean, the ones that are happy, like I love you so much are okay. But the really bad love letters, like the ones that make me just want to crawl, like peel my skin off are like um, the ones where someone has broken up with you mm-hmm. and then you write them a love letter that's kind of angry. Oh my God. Oh my God. I have so many of those. But I will say to one more story about love letters is this is about a love letter that I didn't write. So it's a love letter I received. Um, so mm-hmm. there is a poet named Kama La Macarelle. She's a Mauritian trans woman. She lives in Montreal and um, she has some great books. People should check them out. But um, she and I have been friends for a very long time and we support each other and stuff. But people don't always know that she and I dated. When I was 19, I dated Kama and, and um, <laughs> we I hadn't transitioned yet. Um, and so I was dating as a boy at 19 and um, our romance was very short, but it was very meaningful. And she wrote me a letter to break up with me. Actually, it was like a love letter, but like a breakup love letter. And it was the nicest breakup that I have ever received. You know, I'm 32. It's the <laughs> nicest breakup I've ever received. I've dated hundreds of guys, literally. Um, at Kama, her love letter was so good. And I never answered it because I was so overwhelmed by like, it was so beautiful, but it was also a breakup. I never answered it. And I had forgotten about it until I went looking through my inbox for these love mm-hmm. letters. And and I saw it. And so then I wrote back, but I didn't write back, you know, it had been like 11 years, but I didn't write back in the voice of who I am now. I wrote the love letter that I wish I had written when I was 19. That oh, was, <laughs> it was amazing. Everybody should do this. Everybody should go back to their like teenage self mm-hmm. and write the love letter that they wish they had written. It is wow. such a good exercise. <laughs> oh my God. And okay. also very cringe. But yes, okay. I, uh, I, I'm taking this one as advice. Uh, Are you going to do it? Advice? Yeah, I, I will do that because I mean, I'm over 40. I mean, mm-hmm. writing low letters was my thing. So, oh my God. <laughs> I, Yay. I thought so. I looked at you and I thought, that's a love letter guy. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, I will try that. Let's see what will happen. I'm curious about it. So, I, I will try that. Do you know who you would write your love letter to? Uh, I have I have one. <laughs> yes. Yes, you do. <laughs> I, I, I have one. Yeah. I will do that. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, uh, now I would like to talk about a different topic. Mm-hmm. Uh, yes. Recent censorship activities in North America. Yes. It's hundreds of books are getting banned in schools and libraries. Yes. Es- especially in Florida. Oh my yes. God. The t- tons of negative news. More than 300 books have been banned in Florida recently. And the list includes some literary classics, some books adapted into movies, like Forrest Gump. It's Forrest unbelievable. Gump. Yeah. <laughs> to Kill a Mockingbird. Yeah, yeah. unbelievable. <laughs> so, Kai, if you feel you're supposed to write a letter, love letter or a regular Otherwise. letter, <laughs> to those censors, what would you say to them? What would be your message to them? Let's go with love letter because... Yeah. Love letter to the censors. Mm, I might I might actually write that later. Um, if it was a love letter, I would say I get it. I really do. I've been a part of the North American like leftist movement for mm-hmm. most of my life. And um, the, the kind of censorship you're talking about is coming more from the right wing. You know, they're trying to suppress primarily texts that they call critical race texts and also like texts with like gender theory. Um, so they're mm-hmm. trying to suppress, you know, literature by people of color and queer people, you know. So that's not great. I, I hate that. That's very scary. But the um, from the left also, there has been a censorship movement to suppress, you know, various types of voices that the left doesn't like. And, and, and so this, because of this, I actually really get it. I get it. It is very scary to hear people or to read people as work that threatens our sense of who we are. <laughs> like, <laughs> I know that. <laughs> I think as queer people, especially we have the gift of knowing what it is like to have our reality and our identity questioned. And what these texts are questioning are the identity of the nation, the nation of America, the nation of Canada, and the notion of goodness upon which we are supposedly founded, which of course we were not. Um, But, you know, for the people who are trying to suppress these books, that is what it's about. And they fear particularly that their children will be exposed to these texts and turn against them. And um, to me, that fear, if I'm really again using the the lens of love, that fear is not so much a fear of the 
the books. It is a fear of the monster inside oneself. <laughs> it is a fear to really look at the nation and oneself and to, th- and to, and to see that America was built on genocide and on slavery, <laughs> Canada as well. And to know that, you know, primarily it's white people who are having this idea, but not always, but as Americans or as Canadians, we have that monster inside of it, something truly uh, horrible. And so I really understand. It's very scary. We don't know what's going to happen. We don't know what's going to happen if the dominant view in America and in Canada becomes, um, you know, the critical view um, that um, our so-called democracy is no longer working Yeah, we don't know. All all I can say is that um, the truth is always more lovable than a lie. And again, queer people know that. (laughs) We know that the truth is more lovable than a lie. So I think that's what I would say. I get that it's scary, but Mm -hmm. the truth is more lovable than a lie. Yeah, that's correct. I believe they need to hear something to get their selves selves together. Because, (laughs) you know, the, the censors sometimes do something really tragic comic let me give you an example i don't know if you encountered that news i guess it was last month yes last month in alabama a children's book just banned because of the author's last name author's <sighs> last name was wow. gay that's a lot okay. the last <laughs> name was gay that's because of that last name that children's book that kid's book banned so this is tragic comic <laughs> so yes, yes unbelievable so that's so weird that, that's why I, i'm getting shocked yeah I mean, it is absurd. It's absurd. Tragicomic, yeah. as you say, like, um, I'm, it's sort of, it's just astounding. But yeah, no, unfortunately, also happening. I'm trying to find the name of the book and the author's name to let our listeners know that. So yes, uh, here it is, because uh, I can know about it. The name of the book is Read Me a Story, Stella. The name of the author is uh, Mary Louis Gay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. So, That's so this, really this, this book is banned now. That's a lot. That's I, I had no idea. I didn't know it had gone that far. Yeah. <laughs> That's a lot. <laughs> Kai, thank you very much for this beautiful conversation. And thank you for this lovely book. Thank you so much. It's been so fun. I'm so grateful. Thank you for having me on your podcast. Thank you, Kai. Dear listeners, now it's time to say goodbye. Thank you for listening to us. Please don't forget to like and share. And stay tuned for the upcoming episode.